we've been here, you know, 21 years with this new exploration program. We haven't launched a single astronaut to space on. That kind of tells you what kind of bureaucracy and inefficiency has infected NASA, as it does most large organizations. Welcome to Expanding Space, Newsweek's deep dive into the cosmos. Expanding Space will push the boundaries of what we know and what we have yet to discover. Today's guest is Leroy Chow, a former NASA astronaut and commander of the International Space Station. Thanks for joining us, Leroy. My pleasure. Great to be here. Dreams and aspirations are obviously a big part of space flight, and it's been a hot topic for months on people's minds. There's Elon Musk and President Trump has been speaking about Mars dating back to the campaign trail. How does that make you feel that there's this public ramped up talk about going to Mars again? I'm optimistic. And, you know, I like to say we've been 20 years from Mars since 1969. After Apollo 11, everyone was sure in 20 years, by 1989, we'd be have moon bases and we'd be on Mars and, and all that. And of course, none of that's happened, right? And when I applied to be an astronaut in 1989 and was fortunate to be interviewed, that was a very exciting time because President Bush 41 was uh, had proposed going to Mars by 2019, by the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. He had proposed a 24% increase in NASA's budget. It was an exciting time to be, uh, you know, interviewing and then getting selected to be an astronaut. And I really thought I might have a shot at going to the moon, you know. But yeah, so now Elon Musk, you know, has stated many, many times that he started SpaceX because he specifically wants to send human colonies to Mars and he himself wants to be a colonist on Mars, right? So that's what's driving him. Of course, he's really you know, flip the launch market on its head by recovering and refurbishing first stage boosters and reusing them. And now, as you know, Starship, once it becomes operational, is really going to be disruptive, being a fully reusable, the heaviest launch vehicle ever launched. Starship, as you know, is going to be like a super shuttle. Not only will it be able to operate in low Earth orbit, it'll be able to go out of orbit, go to the moon. Of course, NASA has a contract with SpaceX to develop a lunar lander based on Starship technology. And Elon says that one day a version of Starship will take around 100 people per trip to, to Mars. So I think the future is bright. I think uh, I think that SpaceX will get to Mars, uh, you know, not, not super quickly. I mean, Elon's always been a bit optimistic, but, you know, maybe within the next 10 years, I would say. There's a lot of angles as to what we still have to fill in terms of technology gaps, but is there maybe one at this point that you think is the most primary issue in terms of going to Mars? Yeah, you know, I mean, really, since the moon landing, we've had the technology to go to Mars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we can get to the moon, you can get to Mars. It's a little farther, there's some other challenges, but you can get there technically. So to me, the biggest technical challenge is biomedical. All these things happen to living systems that evolved here on the Earth. And when you go to space for long duration, and none of them are good, right? Radiation is the obvious one. You know, once you adapt to the zero G environment, the microgravity environment, your your red blood cell count goes down, your white cell goes up. Nobody really knows why. Maybe it's the stress just of being in a weird environment on your body. Over 70% of astronauts that go fly six month missions on the station come back with degraded vision. We don't really fully understand why. We think it has to do with the fluid shift. I believe we still only see this in males. We haven't seen it in any of the women astronauts. And we don't know if that's because they're just physiologically different or we just haven't flown enough women to, to see it yet. And, and then there was there's one astronaut that had the blood clot, right? Right, right. There was the whole, the reverse flow in one of the arteries. It was a right. whole weird thing that if you see that on earth on a person, it's a serious condition sure. and, they, and they found it by accident just by, you know, they're doing an experiment and they go, oh my God, look at this, they're in an ultrasound and the blood is flowing the wrong way, which on earth is a big deal. Yeah. But, you know, it may turn out that it's much more common than we thought in space, right? And for me personally, I know that during EVA, the flight surgeons told me after the mission, they said, well, we saw a number of these pre-ventricular contractions, you know, where your heart kind of beats a little before it should, they don't see it on me on the ground, you know? So there are a number of things that happen in space that we don't fully understand. And we've got to figure out these protocols like the vision. So for the people that do have a degraded vision, does it keep degrading as the longer you stay in space or does it reach a plateau? You know, we, we don't know the answers to the quest these questions. 
how come some people get affected and others don't? I was one of the fortunate ones that didn't get affected. If we send a crew to Mars, by the time they get there, are they going to be blind? You know, we just don't know. What would be the scientific value of pulling off a mission? You know, that Mars is our next nearest neighbor. And two billion years ago, Mars was much more Earth-like, had huge liquid oceans. The atmosphere was much thicker, had a different composition. So, you know, I think there's a pretty decent chance there used to be some kind of life on Mars. Maybe not animals and, you know, things like that, but maybe uh, microbial life, at least. Bacteria or some kind of simple microbes might have existed and might still exist because we've shown, we've discovered liquid water underneath the surface of Mars. So once you have water, um, it's possible that you have some kind of life as we understand it there. So I think it would be very exciting. The thing about human crews, when you send humans, they're very adaptable, right? The Mars rovers have been fantastic. You know, they've been operating for decades now and they've returned a wealth of data. It would be cool to send astronauts who can do exploration much more quickly than robotics and maybe find some definitive evidence that there's life outside of the Earth. It seems like so much is on the near horizon. What excites you most about this next decade of space exploration? What excites me are companies like SpaceX and hopefully Blue Origin. They've just launched their new Glenn rocket a few months ago. They weren't able to catch the, the first stage like they'd hoped to do, but they'll get there. So, you know, SpaceX is doing incredible things and hopefully Blue Origin will start to catch up and be going because it's always good to have more than one uh, a provider, right? But, you know, NASA is not the agency it used to be, unfortunately. It's not even the agency it was during the shuttle era. If you think about the history of NASA, it was created in the late 1950s. Just under 11 years later, NASA had created rockets, trained astronauts, you know, made launch pads, made mission control centers, launch control centers, figured all that out, and just under 11 years, sent humans not only to space, but to the surface of the moon and back. And now the current exploration program, which started in 2004 is Constellation, got revamped in 2008, 2009 under President Obama, got revamped again under President Trump. Uh, you know, so we've been here, you know, 21 years with this new exploration program. We haven't launched a single astronaut to space on it, right? Yeah. So that kind of tells you what kind of bureaucracy and inefficiency has infected NASA, as it does most large organizations, commercial or government or private. I, I hate to say it, I don't want to be a pessimistic, but you know, this current exploration program that NASA is running, we've got a throwaway rocket that NASA's own internal, you know, analyses show is over $4 billion at, uh, per launch if you, you know, factor in development costs. Yeah. And you've got Starship, which is, you know, much, much, much an order of magnitude less than that. How can, how can we continue down that path of government space, if you will? So, as I kind of touched on earlier, the ideal situation would be a partnering with NASA and a company like SpaceX or multiple companies where we can leverage, because what NASA still does an excellent, the best job at, is operations. You know, NASA knows how to run space missions. And uh, if we can leverage that experience with the innovation and the nimbleness of commercial companies like SpaceX and hopefully Blue Origin coming forward, um, that would be the best partnership of all. With that in mind, what pieces of advice would you have for NASA's nominee to become the next administrator? I'm excited about Jared Isaacman. I think that's what we need, a breath of fresh air to come in and, and kind of change things around, disrupt things. You know, he's got a daunting task in front of him. I don't envy him, but I'm hopeful.